Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for, for having me here today. Um, thanks, Morgan. Um, so uh, Aaron Fenster and I co-direct the imaging program and part of our mandate is really to try to uh, bring some of the tools that have been developed in imaging and make them more widely uh, available and, uh, and try to see that they're more widely used uh, in cancer research, certainly throughout the OICR uh, program and, and beyond. So what I'm hoping to do uh, today is to tell you about something that we've been working on for about uh, 15 years now at Sunnybrook, which is uh, an informatics exercise called the Research Biomatrix. Um, partially to let you know what we're doing there, but mainly to uh, suggest perhaps you'll see opportunities uh, for the use of the biomatrix uh, in your own uh, research. And the biomatrix has been designed to be modul modular and scalable so that uh, it's quite possible to use it in either collaborations or use independent clones of, of the structure uh, for, for research in other institutions. So I believe I have control of the screen here. And uh, click, there we go. So first of all, uh, most of you don't need this, but I just want to maybe expand slightly on the definition of precision medicine, uh, at least the way I see it. And that is using information, and it's a combination of demographic information and biomarkers to stratify in individuals to the most effective regimen, not just for treatment, which is the uh, traditional uh, view, I think, of, uh, of precision medicine, but also I think there's important opportunities to uh, optimize um, and be more precise with respect to how we detect uh, disease, how we monitor response uh, to uh, therapy, and also perhaps how we uh, preventive strategies uh, for disease. Uh, initially, of course, our interest is in cancer, but these ideas extend uh, right across the spectrum of, of uh, health and really get away from the idea that one size or one approach to treatment really fits uh, everybody broadly, because we know that that often doesn't work very well. Uh, and by biomarkers, I'm referring to a whole range of things that we can measure. And we may be talking about things like pr uh, protein expression, DNA, RNA, epigenetic factors, or things that you can measure uh, from uh, in vivo or, uh, or ex vivo, say biopsy samples, liquid biopsies, uh, from, uh, uh, but in the form of, often in the form of uh, image derived measurements. So a typical question uh, that you might in, uh, pose in uh, precision medicine would be, can we find, can we identify biomarkers that predict, uh, this is a, one specific study, by the way, that uh, Dr. Kathy Pritchard's been working on with colleagues that predict which uh, HER2 positive metastatic breast cancers will respond to Herceptin, and which will will not, will not because it's known uh, that there is quite a spectrum of response. And if you could figure out uh, those patients where the cancers will respond, you could be much more effective at treatment and also uh, more efficient, reduce costs. Um, I'll just point briefly, and I'm not going to talk about research really in my, in my group, but just kind of tell you how we're using. Uh, the biomatrix. And what the biomatrix really is, is a data warehouse. Uh, it's an integrated informatics warehouse. And uh, we use it to bring data from a whole variety of different sources together uh, to facilitate our research. So two of the, the broad areas uh, my lab is interested in is uh, improving early detection of, of breast cancer through better in vivo imaging, so optimizing existing approaches, developing new approaches, and stratifying as to what the best approach to use would be. That's one side. And then the other side, uh, ex vivo, we're looking at approaches to quantitative digital pathology to better characterize disease, to try to get the right treatment, avoid uh, and avoid over or under treatment of, of cancer. And we have a strong interest in what we call radiomic biomarkers. These are simply measurements that can be derived from images uh, as either direct measurements or by using some fairly sophisticated mathematical transformations. 
And um, on the side of the uh, in vivo early detection, we're looking, for example, and this is <clears throat> the work that's being led by Jane's main prize in my lab, at how we can use measurements on images to uh, predict when uh, a particular type of imaging will be um, appropriate uh, for a detection, a cancer detection task, and stratify patients uh, to appropriate regimens for uh, screening for earlier detection of cancer. Much of our work is being done in breast cancer. And to augment that, we also do micro simulation modeling of breast cancer uh, to, to allow us to efficiently change variables and to optimize the approach to screening. And at the same time, in parallel, uh, we're conducting a very large 165,000 woman uh, randomized trial comparing one screening technique, breast cancer, uh, breast uh, tomosynthesis versus the status quo, which is digital mammography, something that was developed actually uh, initialized in Toronto about uh, 20 years ago, but is now the current technique. And we'd like to see whether we can uh, uh, get better performance with uh, uh, an improved technology. Uh, on the other side, in the uh, pathology lab, we're looking at how we can uh, use pathology more quantitatively. And we're working with John Bartlett's group and others on characterizing spatial heterogeneity by doing uh, quantitative uh, uh, analysis of uh, pathology uh, images of, uh, of uh, sections. And we're also applying some of these ideas to research on immunotherapy in uh, collaboration with Dr. Ohashi at Princess Margaret and Dr. Uri Tabori at uh, Six, Six Kids Hospital. And some of the tools there we use are, uh, and we've spoken of, of those uh, before um, at OICR, are a biomarker multiplexing using an immunofluorescence platform, uh, whole mount, which gives us a, a very good uh, ability to, to kind of do a large area um, co-registration between in vivo images and histology, and developing algorithms to be more quantitative and also reduce the labor in pathology to, to allow uh, it to be carried out more efficiently. Uh, all of this information needs to be put together, and uh, in it, frequently we need to understand patient outcomes, treatment uh, variables, and demographics. And the biomatrix is the a platform that we've developed for that purpose. So as I said, it's just a, a large data warehouse. Um, it was motivated by discussions between Dr. Kathy Pritchard, uh, Dr. Claire Holloway, who's a breast surgeon, and myself about 20 years ago um, to try to make better use of information from the patient's uh, a journey uh, through our uh, health sciences center at Sunnybrook. It's a, Sunnybrook is a major Center. We have programs in several areas, with oncology being one of the uh, one of those major areas. And our, our picture is that every person who comes into contact with the system potentially is a research partner, somebody who could agree uh, to volunteer to allow their information to be included in a uh, in the data warehouse for use in future research. Uh, research that, of course, would have to be approved by uh, an REB, but the agreement to uh, provide that data might be done well before the actual research is conceived. So what we need, ideally, is a prospective informed consent, uh, which can have limits on it, but uh, it, ideally it would be prospective. Um, again, part of the problem that motivated us is that in hospitals like ours, all the different kinds of important patient data are stored on different computer systems, bought at different times using different software that's often incompatible, and they definitely don't talk to each other very well. And researchers uh, frequently use these systems, they manually extract the information, and they um, uh, then uh, you put it onto, an, say, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, in a non-standard way with very little backup and very little ability for anyone else to use the data after they've done their specific study. So to facilitate the research, we're trying to really break down these barriers and to have an integrated uh, place to keep that information so it could be used multiple times in different ways and really uh, create, create some synergy. 
and make it much easier for researchers who were authorized to uh, use this kind of data to actually get a hold of the data. So the biomatrix uh, is just a, a large uh, data warehouse and what it uh, contains are links to uh, stores of images, diagnostic reports, the actual uh, slides, a repository of research tissue samples uh, and information on the important factors that researchers uh, need to consider such as the information associated with treatment, patient de demographics and uh, uh, the out outcomes associated with treatment. Um, this is just a kind of a simple schematic. The, the heart of this is a, uh, is a database. It's called a Postgres database. We have a web server that allows us to talk to it. And then we have a number of other servers that uh, support enormous stores of, uh, of medical, in vivo medical images, uh, pathology scanned, digital pathology slides, et cetera. Uh, we have um, a link to actual samples, pathology samples, blocks, slides, digitized images of those slides. Um, we are building uh, uh, a, an interface to, uh, through C BioPortal to handle uh, genomics and, and other similar uh, data. And then uh, we also have access to the biomatrix by users, and it's all web uh, web based, so it can be. It's quite flexible in terms of where it's used and how access can be achieved, although there are security uh, standards as to getting uh, access to the information. And as I mentioned, the structure is, has been designed in a way that you can basically clone the biometric structure, not all the data that's contained in the central, um, in the central repository, but the structure uh, to allow users in collaborations to essentially see the same interfaces and work together, pool data for specific studies, or in principle, one can simply take the entire biometric structure and create a separate data repository for another purpose. So this is uh, Sunnybrook's picture, and I, I'm just gonna show this quickly. There's a, a myriad of different data sources in a, in a large health sciences center, and the idea and a lot of the work that we've been doing is to try to figure out how to bring information from those sources, uh, both from the technical point of view, bring them together, and also the uh, issue in terms of, of uh, govern governance, privacy, security, et cetera, uh, related to the data. These are some of the internal hospital data sources. Uh, they cover different important areas that researchers care about. One of the ones that we think about a lot is COPATH, with it, which is our pathology lab information system, because usually pathology information comes into just about every kind of uh, research study that we uh, are interested in. So how can we bring the data in? Frequently, it's done by hiring somebody who sits in front of two computers and looks at one, tries to figure out what text uh, in reports means and, and translates those texts into into uh, the research study uh, forms that are being used. So it's very manual, it's very labor intensive, and frequently it has to be done over again as soon as a new study is initiated. So what the biomatrix um, uh, contains are a number of features that we, we uh, have incorporated to try and make things more efficient and uh, as well as maintaining security. So web-based data entry, there are tools that have been incorporated to um, ensure accuracy of uh, inputting information when it's done by a, a data clerk. Um, we've gone through privacy and security and external reviews to ensure that the data are safe and we're protecting our patients uh, from a privacy point of view. Uh, we've done our best to be consistent in terms of how uh, data are defined, the, the data elements, uh, if they're not defined well, so you could imagine if you if you define your pathology measures in different ways, uh, there's it's going to lead to problems. So that uh, there's a lot of effort is put into trying to maintain consistency, and we also have I think a very useful tool that we've been building, which is a cohort identification tool. The idea is that if a researcher is interested in a study, what they want to know is how many patients might be uh, potentially eligible if it's a retrospective study can we go through and determine roughly how many cases that would qualify for that kind of study might be available 
in our institution. So in a case of a collaboration, this could be done efficiently and even be because we're not looking at the specific patient data, uh, just counting how many of what we have, uh, it could be done prior to the need for the REB uh, uh, review. We have uh, very powerful de-identification tools and what we do is we create pseudo patients so that we uh, can look at images of patients uh, on a screen. We can do reader uh, imaging studies and for all intents and purposes, these look like real uh, people. They are real people, but uh, they can't be identified. But frequently to view those images, you have to have a name and a uh, medical record number. And we do this in a way to protect the patient's identity. Um, we um, have a randomizer built in so that we can uh, randomize uh, uh, patients uh, prospectively for trials. And I mentioned already that the structure allows uh, and is built to facilitate intra and interinstitutional uh, projects by cloning uh, versions of the uh, of the biomatrix. Uh, it's been designed to be scalable, um, both in terms of its size and also expanded to other uh, cancer sites. And for clinical uh, trials uh, groups, it's uh, we have a facility to maintain a repository of information for our clinical trial master files. It's being used broadly current, at, at present by all of these different uh, types of researchers. It's a broad spectrum of, of uses, but so far, um, you know, it, it's worked well. We, we obviously have to consult with these people to ensure that the type of, the way that the data are being uh, collected is going to be useful uh, over a broad spectrum of different users. And that's a big challenge. There's currently over 14,000 patients um, in the biomatrix. And uh, you can see some of the uh, researchers at Sunnybrook uh, and the names of the project. It's a very wide spectrum of different applications. We started in breast, so the majority of these things are in breast cancer, but we've gone on to prostate cancer, head and neck, and even moved uh, outside of cancer to uh, musculoskeletal uh, research and uh, ovary, uh, uh, sorry, I mentioned ovarian cancer is another cancer site that we've worked at. We're looking also at, um, at quality of life issues. So there's a geriatric oncology study and we built into the system many of the uh, tools uh, that, uh, that quality of life people would use, these uh, survey tools uh, and measures. And once they're built in, they're accessible to other researchers and they're in digital form. One of the things we're hoping for is uh, to develop by entering information on patients is to develop synergy uh, and, uh, and have more information available that might have been collected in any one particular study. So there are a, a reasonable fraction of the patients have actually been involved in more than one study. Where that occurs, there's the ability, uh, given REV approval, to uh, integrate data and actually get more data than one originally collected uh, oneself. So the kinds of questions that uh, our researchers are currently doing, I mentioned already uh, the idea of trying to uh, stratify according to biomarkers that would be predictive of response. We should, uh, there's also interest in, in trying to avoid over-treating cancers. And Dr. Eileen Rakovich, for example, is looking at whether some patients with DCIS, whether we can find characteristics that would describe which of those patients could be spared radiation therapy. So these are all the, the kinds of questions that uh, come up in precision medicine. Uh, this is one where we're actually using imaging data from a non-invasive optical approach called a diffuse optical tomography to monitor responsiveness to neoadjuvant therapy to determine whether it should be continued uh, or whether uh, some other form of therapy might have to be substituted or added. And this is uh, just a, a non-invasive measure of ox deoxyhemoglobin associated with the tumor, monitoring non-invasively over a period of time during neoadjuvant therapy prior to the definitive surgery. So that's the kind of information, the images and treatment information and outcome information um, and the pathology that would have occurred after that surgery that would be kept in the, uh, in the biomatrix. We're also using it for health services research and looking at cost effectiveness studies and how, how we can actually optimize, say, the frequency, 
uh, the regimen for healthcare interventions. Uh, one example um, uh, of use is uh, Dr. Ellen Warner, uh, one of our medical oncologists, looking at prophylactic mastectomy and trying to understand why it's done, when it's done, and whether it's appropriately uh, done, looking at, uh, at, uh, at this using the biomatrix as a repository for, for data in a study that she calls PINK. These are mostly young women with breast cancer and trying to, uh, uh, trying to determine uh, the uh, behavior around uh, a prophylactic mastectomy. Uh, we're also, uh, we also use it in, uh, in studies around uh, prevention. And the idea is, can we use various uh, biomarkers from images or from say genomic data to determine who is at greatest risk for cancer? And that uh, in, in some cases can be used to optimize surveillance uh, regimens. And, and uh, in addition to um, try to uh, develop and test preventive strategies around different cancers. Um, just uh, very quickly, and this is not exciting stuff, but just to give you a sense of the kinds of forms that are used, we have very detailed, the ability to collect very detailed information on patient demo demographics, all when presented to the researcher, uh, it, they come out in the form of, um, of pseudo-identified data. So it looks like the patient has a name, uh, but basically uh, these are, um, these are pseudo-identities that have been created. And we, we look at things like lifestyle uh, information. It just depends on the study, but uh, we're capable of uh, collecting a broad variety of information. We also track consents. The consents can be structured in terms of the degree of information that an individual will allow. And if, uh, and if the uh, patient decides to withdraw consent at some point in the future, that's also tracked. So we have the ability to follow those things. And at the same time, to look at details in, in, uh, in considerable detail with respect to things like uh, uh, biopsy, uh, pretreatment information, staging of cancers, uh, the, the information on actual treatment, surgical, uh, medical, radiation uh, for various uh, studies. So I'll just close by saying, I believe that there, uh, I hope I've given you an appreciation for what is being done um, I think it has the opportunity, this approach has the opportunity to be used more broadly. I wanted you to know about it. And uh, certainly initially linking uh, with other collaborators within other institutions, but also in terms of more generalized networks of information, such as the Ontario Data Integration Network that Lincoln Stein is uh, beginning to try to create and other, other networks within Ontario and, uh, and Canada. Um, so our own work, we're, we're working to expand to other cancer, uh, cancer sites. And of course, uh, the, there's a huge interest in machine learning and the biomatrix is an excellent uh, source of data because it's such a compre comprehensive source for doing those kind of machine learning studies. Um, and, but I think this will work best uh, when we collaborate broadly because this kind of machine learning research requires an enormous number of, uh, of uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, patients, um, cases in specific areas if we're going to be doing meaningful uh, research. And uh, just to finish with a picture, this is just an example of some of the work in my lab, the histogenomic data uh, from the uh, uh, protein multiplexing and the, uh, the accompanying uh, gene uh, sequence measurements uh, that are uh, used and, and uh, stored within the biomatrix. And I'll stop there. Thank you.